So our last lecture is going to be a lecture on the central nervous system. We're going to look at viruses, bacteria, fungi, and parasites. Inflammation of the meninges or the brain or the brain is the hallmark of central nervous system infection. Like tumors, the size and symptoms depend on the site of the infection, not on the organism. So it's where in the brain does this thing occur, not what is in the brain. Time course for development of CNS symptoms is different depending on what kind of infection is going on. So a viral encephalitis or meningitis will develop over hours to a day, uh, bacterial hours to a week, and then parasites and syphilis hours to years, or excuse me, weeks to years. Three major sites where infections will occur in the nervous system. Uh, they can occur diffusely in the meninges and then we get meningitis, uh, diffusely in the brain, and then we get encephalitis, or locally in the brain, and these are abscesses that are encapsulated. There are other sites where infection can develop, uh, like subdural and epidural spaces, but we're not going to focus on those. We'll fo focus on the most common infections. Let's look first at the difference between meningitis and encephalitis as it relates to clinical presentation. So patients with meningitis um, develop fever, headaches, stiff neck, Confusion, decreased um, confusion, but decreased level of consciousness is less common, and seizures. So this is the patient you're going to do Kernigs and Brzezinski's on, and this patient is going to be positive for both of those special tests. And encephalitis, confusion is very common. Patients also may have some bizarre behavior, just out of character for the patient. Um, and decreased level of consciousness is a, a pretty normal finding in a and encephalitis. There also may be focal neurologic signs and seizures may occur and seizures may either be generalized or focal. We'll talk about the difference between those two things in our seizure lecture. All right, so a little more um, about meningitis. Early, fevers, early features are gonna be a prodromal illness. Um, fever, headache, patients may also have stiff neck. Typically they have um, preservation of mental status. They don't typically have neurologic symptoms and they don't typically have papilla edema. A variety of viruses, bacteria, fungi, and parasites, and neoplasms can cause inflammation of the meninges, but we're having to classify them by their location and not the causative agent. So these are, this is the location is in the meninges and uh, these are our clinical features. So some of the later features um, in the course of the illness would be seizures, cranial nerve palsies, death, focal neurologic signs and symptoms, and then finally stupor and coma. Clinical features that suggest a meningitis rather than an encephalitis, and this may come up on a test, um, would be stiff neck, again, relative preser preservation of mental status, a lack of focal neurologic signs, and no papilla edema. Our time course here um, for a viral meningitis is a few hours to develop over um, acutely over a period of a few hours. Uh, bacterial meningitis develops over hours to a day, and a fungal or a tuberculosis meningitis is a little bit longer. It can be over several days um, to two weeks that this illness um, takes to, to really get up and running. So our lab findings, we're going to see um, elevated white blood cells, we're going to see an elevated SED rate, but the CSF is going to be our key to diagnosis. So this is going to be um, what's, what's very, very important for you to obtain and for you to know what the different, how the different types of meningitis show up in the CSF. So when we look at CSF, it'll take about um, so somewhere between a day and three days for a bacterial culture to come back, up to three weeks for a viral culture. Gram stains um, of the CSF sediment are obtained, as well as latex agglutination, antigen tests, and PCR for syphilis. So here are the findings that you would expect in a viral or an aseptic meningitis as it relates to the CSF. So you're going to get a negative gram stain, negative bacterial culture because it's a viral infection. And the most common viruses that are going to be isolated are enteroviruses, um, including the Coxsackie virus B and the echovirus. On CSF inspection, you are going to see pleocytosis with a mononuclear 
predominance. So these are very important. Um, you really need to know what your cerebrospinal fluid is going to show in the different types of infections. So again, pleocytosis, mononuclear predominance, uh, normal or a mildly elevated protein, and normal glucose. So most of these patients are going to recover within a week or two. So we're just going to hang out and uh, make sure that they're comfortable as they can be and that um, they understand their prognosis is very good. In fact, hospitalization, oh, excuse me, hospitalization is rarely required for these patients. Um, their, their prognosis is very good. But we do give headaches for, or excuse me, analgesics for headaches or antiemetics for nausea, that kind of thing to keep the patient comfortable. Acute bacterial meningitis. Uh, this can be acquired in the community, um, also can be healthcare associated. The most common causative organisms in the adult population in community acquired meningitis are going to be strep pneumo and N meningitis. Um, healthcare associated are going to be staphylococci and aerobic gram negative bacilli. The patient here is going to present with nuchal rigidity, headache, lethargy, nausea, vomiting, and fever. And on physical exam, we will see Koenig's and Brzezinski sign. 15% um, will have focal neurologic signs, and about 33% will have either generalized or focal seizures. So just a quick reminder of, of Koenig's signs. When you flex the hip to 90 degrees and then extend the patient's knee, and this causes pain. Uh, it's a relatively reliable sign of meningeal irritation, but it may also occur with a, a herniated lumbar disc, for example, or um, tumors in the, in the lower spinal cord. So you just have to put it all together with the rest of your clinical picture. Um, Brudzinski's sign is flexing the patient's neck, causes the patient to flex hips and knees to alleviate some of that discomfort. And again, that's a sign of meningeal irritation. I always remembered it because brain and Brudzinski start with B and you're lifting the patient's brain up off the table to see what's happening. So if that helps you, use it. If it doesn't, dump it. All right, acute bacterial meningitis. So we're going to do blood cultures. We're going to do an LP. And this is what we're going to see on LP. Again, very, very important for you to know the differences between the LP findings. So our CSF is going to show an elevated opening pressure. Um, our white count is going to be between 50 and 10,000. Our glucose is going to be decreased, protein elevated, and very often we'll get a positive gram stain. Antibiotics should be started immediately um, after an IV line has been placed and blood cultures have been drawn. The LP can be can uh, be performed after. So if you're very suspicious of meningitis, we're getting these patients on antibiotics ASAP. So ceftriaxone, um, you, you have all the, the drugs right there. So go ahead and read through those. Again, I'm not gonna test you on doses, but I will expect you to know um, an appropriate three medication um, regimen for a patient who's over 50 or um, treatment for everyone else, which includes the ceftriaxone and vancomycin. So when indicated, dexamethasone is going to be given 15 to 20 minutes before or at the time of the antibiotic administration. You have a dose there, but don't memorize it. Um, we don't give to adults who've already received antimicrobial therapy because it's not likely to improve their outcomes. So the only reason that we give dexamethasone is because there are good studies to suggest that it improves long-term outcomes. Uh, we only continue the dexamethasone if the CSF gram stain or the CSF or blood cultures reveal a strep pneumo. Um, if susceptibility studies show intermediate susceptibility to ceftriaxone, um, then rifampin is added. So now that we've looked at these bacterial, uh, and so now that we've looked at the appropriate antibiotics to prescribe, 
it's important to note that sometimes dexamethasone will be given either before or at the time of the antibiotic antibiotic administration. Not given to adults who've already had antimicrobial therapy because it's not likely to improve the outcome for those patients. Um, but early administration of glucocorticoids, um, usually dexamethasone, has been evaluated as adjuvant therapy and in an attempt to diminish the rate of hearing loss and other neurologic complications um, may also decrease the rate of mortality in some patients. Um, if susceptibility studies show after you've done your um, CSF gram stain and cultures, if susceptibility shows intermediate susceptibility to ceftriaxone, then we add rifampin to the regimen here. So this is a jumping a little bit back over to the um, to the treatment. So we're, we're doing antibiotics, we're doing corticosteroids, and that's immediately. Then we continue all this if the um, CSF gram stain and or the CSF real, uh, reveal strep pneumo, and if there is um, intermediate susceptibility to the medications that we're using, then we'll add rifampin to that. Chemoprophylaxis, um, if there's suspicion of meningeal cockle or H. flu meningitis, then rifampin can be given as prophylaxis. Um, susceptible individuals can be vaccinated for some strains of um, meningococcus, pneumococcus, and haemophilus. And we do suggest prophylaxis for contacts of people with meningi meningi meningococcal meningitis. And again, we will give uh, rifampin for that. Um, and then our alternate agents are going to be ceftriaxone in a single dose or ciprofloxacin. So here are the meningococcal vaccination recommendations for your reference, not for your memory. Um, but do read through them so you have some idea of what goes on when because you'll need to make sure that you um, are treating your patients with preventative medicine as well as what you have available through your prescription pads. <laughs> All right, spirochete meningitis. Uh, these are going to be chronic infections. The common organisms are going to be Lyme's disease um, and neurosyphilis. In the CSF, we're going to see lymphocytic pleocytosis, elevated protein, normal glucose, and the serologic tests will confirm the diagnosis. Um, and what we're looking or doing the conf confirmatory tests that we're doing are VDRL for syphilis and Lyme antibody titers for Lyme's disease. And we're going to give high dose penicillin or ceftriaxone for several weeks. So high white cell count, elevate high protein, and normal glucose on this CSF. Moving on to encephalitis. 90% uh, of encephalitis is caused by uh, viruses. HSV is going to be um, the, the most common. We also have arthropod-borne viruses that can be um, part of the transmission as well. Infection from these viruses leads to necrosis of neurons and lysis of the glial cells, and then we get secondary cerebral edema. The inflammatory response includes infiltration of the lymphocytes and macrophages um, that often ends the infection, but the patient may be left with neurologic sequelae. And if you're not familiar with the word sequela, it's just um, Signs and symptoms that linger is what that means. So for these encephalitis patients, you're going to have abrupt onset of fever, headache, decreased level of consciousness, and photophobia. Very often these patients will be obtunded. Um, other common features include seizures, either focal or generalized, hyperreflexia, a positive Babinski sign. Occasional patients will develop other focal neurologic signs like hemiparesis, aphasia, ataxia, limb, Tremors and cortical blindness, all of these things can happen. Very often these patients will have a prodromal illness and it varies depending on the infectious agent, but often characterized by 
fever, malaise, myalgias. Um, the primary difference between encephalitis and meningitis are that patients with encephalitis develop prominent mental changes and minimal or absent stiff neck. The EEG in these patients is always abnormal. Uh, you need to understand their CSF findings as well. We have a slight increase in opening pressure, uh, lymphocytic pleocytosis, normal glucose, mildly elevated protein, and our bacterial and viral cultures are generally sterile. Um, we can do an MRI, and if we do, we will see hyperintensity in the temporal lobes, the inferior frontal lobes, and the insula. So here's an EEG from a patient with HSV encephalitis. And whether you can appreciate it or not, trust me, this is diffuse slowing of the background activity. These waves are, are very, very slow. And then we have um, some occasional activity over the right temporal region. And the right temporal region is going to be up in here. Excuse me, no, that's not correct. Here and here. I apologize. HSV encephalopathy uh, mortality rate is 70% if untreated, 19% if treated, and about 50% of these patients are left with neurologic deficits or neurologic sequela. Um, polymerase chain reaction of the cerebrospinal fluid for HSV DNA will be done and on MRI, we'll see necrotic or hemorrhagic lesions of the temporal and frontal lobes. Um, acyclovir improves outcome. And uh, so we, we give acyclovir and you have your dose there for your information, not for your memory. So we have increased signal intensity um, from the right temporal tip medially to involve the hippocampus, the amygdala, and the parahippocampal gyrus. West Nile virus. Uh, this is transmitted by mosquitoes. When patients um, develop this, this viral infection, they very often will have muscle weakness or paralysis diminished and diminished reflexes. CSF on these patients is going to show an increased white blood cell count, increased protein, and sometimes increased neutrophils. And on MRI, we may see um, inflammation of the basal ganglia, and this may contribute to some movement disorders that are similar to Parkinson's disease because of where they're located. Um, there are very often severe neuropsychiatric sequela, and there's no good treatment here, so we're just managing um, comfort and complications. Last but not least, we will look at brain abscesses. So etiology, infectious agents can get access to the central nervous system in a lot of different ways, either by direct extension from another infection within the cranial cavity, so a mastoiditis, a sinusitis, and a titus media. Um, also from an infection following a skull fracture or craniotomy. Um, hematogenous spread uh, from endocarditis or IV drug abuse. They are caused by bacteria um, and fungi and parasites, but not viruses. And remember that the brain abscess, abscess is a focal infection of the brain. It begins as a localized encephalitis with focal necrosis and focal inflammation. But as the process continues, then we get this encapsulated, um, we get this encapsulated lesion that has uh, some surrounding edema. Bacterial and fungal abscesses uh, do continue to expand and they are lethal if not treated. However, the parasitic abscesses tend to stop growing somewhere around 10 to 15 millimeters. Very often, we will need to biopsy these patients to rule out tumor and to culture the organism. Uh, multiple pathogens, depending on initial infection. Um, and then immunocompromised patients tend to get fungal and parasitic abscesses. Clinical features here, um, they're typically subacute in onset. Early in the course of the illness, uh, patients may have some generalized headache, lethargy, intermittent fever, uh, also may have generalized or focal seizures. Focal signs may also be present early, depending on the size, uh, or excuse me, depending on the location of the lesion. As the mass expands, um, increased intracranial pressure becomes more pronounced and you'll get some of the psychomotor slowing, lethargy, 
increasing confusion, focal neurologic signs become more prominent, and eventually death can occur as a result of brain herniation from the expanding mass. CT and MRI will show a low density necrotic center with very well developed contrast enhancing borders. Um, and then there's some surrounding cerebral edema. LP is not helpful and may be contraindicated depending on how much space in the brain this lesion is taking up. And so if there is a, a large lesion, then the lumbar puncture might precipitate a brain her herniation and result in death. You can see here a CT scan, that ring enhancing lesion, and here on MRI even more beautiful. Last but not least, treatment for these abscesses. Broad spectrum antibiotics, as soon as the diagnosis is made, we give IV antibiotics for six to eight weeks. The immediate threat from the abscess is a mass effect. So we do surgically drain off pus and often this will um, decrease the increased ICP. So we send anything that we pull out of that abscess for culture and gram stain. And then we'll do serial CTs to make sure that the, the abscess is shrinking appropriately. If, if it's responding, oh, excuse me, if it continues to expand despite the antibiotic treatment, then we may have to um, get neurosurgery on board to intervene as um, a rupture in, into the ventricle or herniation obviously is, is typically fatal. So if our, antibiotic, our antibiotics aren't doing it, then we need to get neurosurgery on board. Mortality is pretty high, 30 to 65 percent, depending on where you look, and lower rates are patients who um, receive combined therapy with antibiotics and surgery. About 50 percent of these survivors still will have neurologic sequelae, things like seizures and focal neurologic deficits. And that is the end of brain tumors and the end of the recorded lectures. If you listened to them in order, I appreciate the opportunity to record these um, and not have to and not force you to be in class tomorrow and I will see you on Monday.